All right, everyone. I am here with Conrad Tolmar. Conrad is a research director at Electronic Arts, or EA as you may know it, as well as an associate professor at KTH. Conrad, welcome to the Twimble AI podcast. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks for inviting us. It's lovely to be here. I'm really looking forward to digging into our conversation. We'll be talking about, uh, as the audience might imagine, the intersection of AI and games. Uh, before we do, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background. Uh, I mentioned KTH. What is KTH? Oh, KTH is Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. It's a technical university uh, where I did my undergraduates as well as my PhD. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think my interest for AI started quite a long time ago, uh, starting with uh, computer vision, uh, and I always been passionate about photography. Uh, and I saw then there was an opportunity to combine my kind of interest for photography then with kind of my academic. Uh, and uh, so that that's were kind of my starting point here. Nice. And um, tell us a little bit about your, uh, the kind of research that interests you in your professorship and, um, you know, in your graduate studies? Mm -hmm. So uh, my PhD was about media spaces uh, and we built different kind of interactive environments to, I mean, to connect places with video streams, but also being able to use sensors to convey other kinds of information if you're close or if you're in the proximity of a space and so forth. That led me eventually to explore that further uh, after my, I graduated uh, and I spent some time working in smart and interactive environments. Um, some of these were for play and some were for more like everyday use. And I think some of us could remember, re recall the kind of demos you saw out of MIT's Media Lab of the late 90s. Uh, a lot of this was kind of cool demos, but you were not really, we were not really able to build any kind of more intelligent environments in this way. So I then got the opportunity to do my postdoc at MIT AI Lab with Trevor Dorrell, where I saw an opportunity to kind of to dwell into more the underlying technologies and start to really use computer vision and start to understand how you can track movements in the room, for example, uh, and, and then see how this could kind of be calm uh, as an input uh, in this kind of interactive spaces. Nice, nice. That reminds me a little bit of, as an undergrad, I went to RPI Rensselaer in New York and they had a, like an interactive design program and they would put these installations up in the library. Uh, this was before, you know, Things, a lot of modern things like connect and, and other things, but they were always really, really interesting. Um, and uh, I'm imagining now as you're describing this intersection of, you know, those kinds of installations and intelligence, uh, you know, the and machine learning like uh, we've got now. Um, is that what kind of connected you to, to games? Somewhat. Uh, I think we need to take a few more steps here because I guess one of the really great opportunities, even if we don't, didn't have AI as today, I mean, this was 20 years ago almost. So we, we were just in the beginning of like starting to apply. I mean, the first versions of OpenCV came out uh, and we started to play around with this. But we were also able to get some kind of new cold hardware. So uh, one of the product where we got the box uh, from Nokia, which was the very first camera phones uh, the, uh, that came out with also an integrated web browser. And this box was basically labeled, feel free to play. So what, what do you do with the camera phone? We thought, well, and then we scratch our head for a bit and we came up with this idea of, well, maybe you can search with images rather than keywords. And you take a picture of something uh, and that become your sort of the search here. Um, and, and these kind of things. And we also had a very early version of something similar to the Connect camera, uh, like a 3D camera where we can 
track body movements and we looked upon, okay, how can you use these body movements to interact with the 3D world? And I think that was one of the first kind of things where I saw a bit of a connection to gaming because we were trying to set up experiments around this and started to study sort of how people feel, felt about navigating in a 3D world with your body gestures instead. Uh, and we played with different kind of tools that were available back then. But sort of in the end of the day, the one that we picked was actually Half-Life. So we hacked Half-Life uh, and that became like the, the engine then uh, that we used for to create this more like 3D experiments. Uh, and this is something that I've been carrying with me ever since. And uh, even fairly recently when we da did studies on simulators for self-driving cars, uh, we have been using game engines rather than these kind of physics simulators that is quite typical in automotive industry. Because somehow, if, if you're lo more looking into sort of the user experience of these environments, uh, they, are, they are the best. <laughs> mm. And maybe this is, has kind of brought me here at EA to start to then look into more like what could we do with AI into the games as it is now. Got it. Got it. And, and so tell us a, a little bit about your role at EA and, and what your focus is there. Well, um, we look into, we are, I'm part of an applied research team called Seed. Uh, and we look into all kinds of different emerging technologies that eventually could be used in the games. So we follow state of the art. We, most of, well, several of us has PhD uh, background. Uh, we research and we also contribute and we publish papers and so forth. Maybe not the same extent as you would if you would be in a, like an academic research lab. But uh, mm -hmm. so we stay connection with the community. We look upon these techniques and see how we can eventually use them into the games. Uh, and there are lots of different ways that AI can be used in, in games. What uh, area of focus do you, um, you know, what, what's the kind of more specific area of focus for you and your group? Well, as you say, uh, there is plenty to do, or there is plenty of opportunities nowadays. I mean, with this kind of formal explosion of AI over the last decade, uh, it's, it's rather a bit hard to pick what to do and what to not to do, because mm -hmm. you, you can do so many things. You can, I, but I guess, I mean, people maybe think about AI more into the games. Uh, and this is something that we also look into. But for us, uh, AI has also a fundamental role when it comes to creating the games. Uh, I mean, the kind of games that we do, uh, they are massive. And, and the production of them are also uh, very long and very costly. Uh, and, and there is a lot of things that could be done with AI into this. So we can use AI to create assets of all kinds. We can uh, create, I mean, different kinds of media, speech, you can create uh, animations uh, and, and so forth. Uh, but you can also then use AI to test these assets. If they look okay, if they behave okay, and then you play, put them into the game and then you can start, continue to look into, okay, how do they behave? How, we, how do they affect the gameplay experience? Uh, and, and then you can march on. And when, when you eventually have a game, uh, I mean, collecting all kinds of information around the game, how people experience the game, what they like about the game, what they don't like about the game, how the game works out. Uh, doing that data analytics is also, of course, a big part of how we apply AI at EA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I think about games, uh, and this is perhaps true for many folks in the audience, I think about deep reinforcement learning. Um, it, to what degree are, are the is the work that you're doing centered on uh, the application of reinforcement learning? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for asking. And uh, 
yeah, it's definitely reinforcement learning is on the top of our agenda as well. However, it's not that easy to use. I mean, we, we play <laughs> around with it and, you know, uh, the work that has been going on in the past, uh, you can show where you can demonstrate the feasibility, uh, but then turn it into something that actually works in the game. Uh, so th that's a bit of a different matters here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, testing is one of the areas that you focus on and you've published several papers on the, the application of uh, machine learning to testing games. Can you give us an overview of uh, that that general area, game testing and, and how AI fits in? Thanks. Yeah, of course. Uh, so game testing came out actually out of some experiments we did a few, couple of years back uh, when we looked into how to use uh, reinforcement learning uh, into the games. And we were uh, successful in actually in creating some uh, NPCs, non-playable characters, uh, and put them into the game. Uh, and, and they were trained with uh, reinforcement learning. But we also learned then that it's quite hard, actually, uh, to fine-tune their behavior. So uh, they actually behave in a way that is believable and that uh, gamers like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think here, here you have a bit of a different twist as well. I mean, typically, uh, when, when you work with AI, uh, you would like to make AI that if you have it in a self-driving car, for example, uh, the car should behave like we drive them, or pro preferably even better. Uh, AI into the game have somewhat different constraints. They all don't always have to work perfectly like that, but they need to be believable. And mm -hmm. that is kind of one thing that we learned, and that we can create agents that behave well, but still there is the subtle qualities or lack of qualities and how they behave that, that still gamers reacted towards. Uh, so we decided then to take a bit of a step back uh, and rather than look upon, okay, how could we use this agent maybe to start at least to explore uh, testing the games with the agents. So this is something that we've been doing then for like two years uh, or something like that now. Uh, with in different flavors. Um, what does it mean for the characters to be believable? Does is it you know simply a, a matter of them not being too good and kind of having their own uh, you know foibles, or uh, are there nuances to that aspect of believability? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think there's two parts of that. Uh, one is, well, how they behave individually. Uh, 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 and uh, they need to walk as you expect them to do. So, uh, I mean, of course, you, you start... I, I think we all tend to behave somewhat different in a game. But, I mean, if you walk out uh, in the real world, I mean, you follow a path uh, and you typically don't walk over a piece of grass. Um, and even in games, that behavior is uh, happens again. So if this uh, agent just walks straight uh, uh, and doesn't kind of have any tendency of, of variations that we expect humans to have, then they start to appear a bit oddly. Yeah. Uh, so that is one part. But then it's also, and this is even harder, uh, how they act in a group. So if you have a group of, of agents, they, they need to kind of somehow understand each other. So we uh, think that they have some kind of shared context or shared goal. If they're just running around on their own, they will behave also quite odd. Mm -hmm. Or at least the behavior of them will look like a bit odd. And when you think of them in, in groups, uh, I'm imagining you were talking about both groups of these um, NPCs as well as when they're collaborating with humans. True. Yeah. Uh, collaborating with humans is also quite difficult because to read the gamer's intent and to participate in that gameplay, uh, I, I think that is still a bit further down the road. 
uh, you can have them as companions in the games. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think you see more and more games now that, that uh, start to adapt that. So uh, uh, some of the players are uh, AI uh, agents uh, and some are real humans. Uh, but um, again, to make this believable, it's uh, depending on the game and depending on what task they have. Yeah, uh, if you have a crowd that should follow you is one thing. If you should sort out some collaborative task, uh, that that is very hard to do today. Got it. But on the other hand, if you twist this around again, if you look into game testing, uh, some of these constraints you can relax tremendously, because even you can say then, well, it's sometimes good that these agents doesn't behave yet like humans or like everyone would do because you know the way we test games is, is twofolded firstly i mean uh, and the most part of the testing is done by having a large amount of human testers sit and testing through the games uh, and through different scenarios or different uh, parts of the game uh, but then we also work with some kind of automated tool so we can create agents scripted agents that could solve some tasks, and then you can sort of drop them into the game uh, and they, you can see that the uh, navigation mesh, for example, in the game works. So they can take, they, they can go from one position to another position and so forth. But then when you work with uh, reinforcement learned agents, uh, sometimes it's good that they don't behave as humans because then they will find bugs that typically humans will not find. So they will walk through a wall uh, that human testers might not do mm. because you see a wall uh, 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 and then you walk around it, but the agents doesn't care. So they just walk th just straight through the wall instead. And that's yeah. how you uh, sort of find these exploits in the game. Interesting, interesting. So when, you, when we're, we're talking about um, testing uh, in the context of... Um, well, specific to some of the, the articles that you share that we'll be talking about, the improving playtesting coverage paper and the augmenting automatic automated game testing paper, are we talking about using deep learning uh, agents, for example, to test the games broadly, or are we talking about testing the NPCs in the games using other AI? I think what we need to realize there, there is a couple of challenges to, uh, that we need to work on. Uh, and one of them is like a lot of the academic research about reinforcement learning agents uh, and testing or playing games uh, are still fairly simple games. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if, if you go into uh, and Rod would like to apply that in, in a, like a full 3D game with a lot of other things, a lot of other uh, agents, uh, and a lot of that dynamics. Uh, that that is way harder. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also need to make this work on, on onto the game engines that we are using. So uh, it, it eventually could be used in runtime. Mm -hmm. um, got it. So you're you're. I think you're suggesting that the you know the Atari games that we associate with uh, reinforcement learning are a far are far simpler than you know the typical game that EA is producing today. Um, and I get that. I think you mentioned. I'm trying to confirm what I thought I heard, which was a couple of different use cases. One is that you want to introduce these NPCs, these automated characters into the games, and you need some way to test them. Um, and then I think I heard separately that you want to be able to test the games generally, make sure, make sure that the walls don't let you walk through them. And that's potentially another area for the use of machine learning or reinforcement learning. And I'm curious, which of those are you working on? Or are you working on both of those? Um, and uh, what that, you know, if, if so, you know, I'm curious to explore those areas. Yeah. So so uh, we, we have published a couple of papers recently. And one was on COG last year, uh, where we basically just introduced this 
notion of using reinforcement learning agents into 3D games uh, and looked upon what, what kind of tests you can do with them. Uh, and then we saw there was a couple of things you can do. I mean, you can see uh, what, what kind of coverage they have. Uh, they could find exploits in the games. Uh, you can find places, for example, where um, players might get stuck. Um, but also uh, other things like that. So uh, that was the first stepping stone. And then from that, we, we have more looked into uh, how you can generalize this in a couple of different ways. One is like, um, like we talked a bit about like an agent, um, if you train an agent, uh, a typical behavior is then that it would maximize the, the, the sort of the, the, how it goes from A to B, uh, not on the straight line maybe, but like as quick as possible. And this is typically not the way we play games. So, uh, a more human-like way to play games is to explore the game somewhat. And maybe you would like to check whether a place to go is safe enough and, and you kind of sneak in and sneak out and go around it in different ways. Uh, so so that, that has been one of the explorations to look a, upon a, a, a model that is driven by curiosity instead of, of, of sort of an optimal path in, uh, as is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so tell us a little bit about that, that work and the idea of these models that are curiosity driven. Um, how does that differ from kind of the this classical idea of tuning your explore exploit type of parameters uh, in reinforcement learning? Uh, it goes along those lines, of course, but we, what we needed to try out here is first kind of to what sort of what coverage these agents could have. Mm -hmm. uh, but then as another problem that arises here is like when you train these agents and, and you test the games with these agents, uh, the agents themselves will not tell you really what they have done. Uh, so uh, if an agent goes through a wall, for example, or if an agent doesn't find a spot, uh, they will not tell you this. So a, a second part on this work was really about also how could you visualize the behavior of these agents? So a game designer eventually could look upon these visualizations uh, and check whether their map or the world that they have created works as they wanted it to be. Uh, and so that, that is also became a very important part of that work. Uh, sort of collect all this data, creating different kind of visualization representations. So you can find trajectories through the maps. You can find um, like heat maps where people, where agents are or haven't been um, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're creating an agent to explore a, a video game, are you and in your paper in particular, are you substituting some notion of a uh, score-based um, reward uh, system for one that's purely curiosity-based? Do you like do you not care about the score if the agent you know gets great coverage of the the game, or is there also uh, do you also need to build in some notion of score so that you're you know, testing the things that humans would more likely do? Mm. Um, yes and no. I, I think still we are in the phase of that this exploration that these agents are doing, uh, it's fairly early on, uh, mm. and make them actually to play the game in full. So they collect like levels and scores as you would normally do in a game. Uh, that that is still research to come. Uh, so at this point, we're more looking into how we can make them navigate around and, and explore the space in, in the best way. And also being able to, I would say, to uh, if you look upon games, uh, it's not just running around in the games anymore. I mean, 
uh, typically in a game, you, you have other kinds of ways to navigate. You have different um, kind of instruments. You might have elevators that could take you from one mm -hmm. level to another. You might need to climb. Uh, some of the new games also enable you to fly through uh, the game. So you have a jetpack or something like that. Uh, and this more advanced form of navigation is, is still, I, I would say, very much work in progress uh, okay. on our side. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I hear you trying to temper my you know, enthusiasm or my sense of where things are with the, the class of games that you're working with. You know, maybe take a step back and, and uh, walk us through kind of where, you know, where you are with the, the agents and the, and the types of games that you are, um, that you're focused on at EA, kind of how far along are you and um, what are the, the key challenges that you run into when you kind of you know scale from montezuma's revenge to a modern video game right so uh like we talked a bit about i mean uh, the, the way uh you navigate around in the space uh kind of comes down to the persona uh, and what kind of game archetype you are if you're uh, an aggressive player or if you're a cautious player uh, so this is very m things that we are uh, very much interested in where we look into now, uh, wh whether you with some form of imitation based learning, uh, demonstration by game testers or, or even the game designers could pick up some of these uh, archetypes and then use this data uh, when we train the agents. So the agents actually uh, tend to kind of get this kind of more multitude of, of, of character when, when they test or play the game. So that's that's uh, one thing. But uh, another thing that we also uh, look into uh, is uh, one of the problems with reinforcement learning and training of reinforcement learning agents, uh, I, I think a lot of us uh, have discovered is that you do play, you train it on a fairly static environment. Uh, so, uh, and if you change something in the environment, uh, you need to retrain the whole uh, uh, sort of model again. Uh, and this is kind of very unpractical if you are in, in a game development uh, cycle where you continuously change the games and the maps uh, and you make updates uh, and fix bugs and so forth. So uh, this is something that we also are very much interested in how we can uh, get models that is more adaptive to uh, dynamic environments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how do you go about doing that? Well, uh, I mean, there is a couple of different ways you can do that. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the known techniques is called uh, POET. Uh, uh, and th that is kind of used to uh, kind of dynamically change the complexity in the environment. So the agents encounter a more and more complex environment to train on. Uh, our approach is somewhat, has drawn a quite a lot of inspiration from Poet, but has a bit of a different take in that we take two reinforcement agents um, one is we call the generator, and another one it's called we are solver. So uh, the generator basically create the games. So using procedurally generated uh, algorithm um, the, to create game elements, uh, and the other agents try to solve this, and then they could work together uh, as a pair uh, in uh, different ways. So one is you, you can create models that handle more dynamic environment, uh, but you can also use this to kind of create levels of, of various kinds. So think about uh, car race, for example, where I have one of the agent is kind of creating the track for you. Uh, and the other agent is try to drive this track. And then they could work in a pair uh, and you can in, in that also 
try out how difficult this track is uh, by having different agents test the track. And then over population, you can then determine, well, this is a track level 10, or this is a track level five or something like that. So this is how you can eventually also then implement it in the game to not only test the game, but you can also here uh, test sort of the complexity in the game uh, and uh, then appro appropriately uh, set different scores on how difficult the tracks are. Got it, got it. Uh, so it sounds like that last example ties into... Um, it, it's got this element of you training up an agent that can allow you to assess the complexity of a, a given environment, but you could also start to leverage it for, you know, creating new environments, uh, either, you know, either in the studio or, or, you know, from the game itself. Am I hearing from that the game much? itself? Yeah. And I think this is from, for us, uh, a tool that could be used in different ways. I mean, you can have it, you can imagine that this could eventually be a stepping stone into real game AI, where you uh, start to sort of adapt the environment uh, towards the actual player uh, and how the player plays the games. So you, you get a better gaming experience out of that. Uh, but you can also eventually think that this could be put into the tools when you create games. So uh, if you put these agents into the editor, you can test sort of the map or, or the environment uh, in real time. So mm -hmm. if you put two things too far apart, the agent will tell, well, I will never be able to jump from this to that. But yeah. then you can just in the editor put them a bit together, and then you see. Well, then you have a map that works, so you don't even have to test it eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, besides from the things that we we talked about thus far, are there other aspects of um, using RL for game testing that um, that you've kind of learned along the way? What what you know? What, I'm I'm curious about the the practicalities of trying to apply RL in the ways that you are, and uh, are there, you know, either particular kind of, you know, lessons learned or tricks that you've come across, or yeah. uh, anything that would be worth sharing there. I think, and I heard it on the podcast here before. I mean, if you relate to self-driving cars a bit, mm -hmm. uh, there is one thing to test things in the lab or in an experiment. Uh, but then, of course, how you deploy it in the real world is very different. And yeah. of course, a game doesn't need to be bulletproof uh, as a car uh, or a self-driving car, uh, but they st should still work. I mean, the games are used by millions and millions of users, and they will find all kinds of bugs and problems in there, for sure. Uh, so the games need to be very, very robust and, and very functional. Uh, and also here, uh, more to that, that some of these techniques are still a bit controversial, I would almost say, among game designers, because uh, you don't really know what you get. I mean, AI is very still much a black box. So if, if you train a model of some kind, uh, you need to make sure that there is a way for a game designer or a tech artist uh, that work with these assets or uh, content that they could sort of add their flavor to it and they could feel that they could control this. Because getting to the game experience, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a delicate piece of uh, art, uh, actually, to, to make games that uh, feels good and are playable and are fun. And I think if, if you introduce a lot of AI things that kind of work, but still doesn't really behave as you think they should, uh, I think that could rather ruin the game experience than add to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this is uh, something that we need to work a lot more on 
how to kind of be able to control this uh, AI agent or do its models uh, and adapt them to different sort of context and usage. Mm -hmm. Uh, beyond the work in reinforcement learning, you, um, you've also done some work in the application of uh, CNNs to detecting glitches in, in games. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that work. What is a, a glitch in the context of a, a, <laughs> a glitch is, well, a glitch could be many different things. I mean, uh, low level glitches are problems in, in the hardware or in the drivers. So uh, suddenly you get the white space or, or, or a white screen or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you have a lot of other kinds of glitches. Uh, typically, it's more uh, that uh, when you create these games, there, there is tons of content and assets. And someone just forget to put a texture on something somewhere. Okay. Uh, so uh, we, we started to then look into, okay, how could we use a reinforcement learned agent to kind of more walk around in the space to, yeah, look if everything looks okay or not. Uh, and then on top of that, that's kind of then fairly straightforward to use like a, a computer vision uh, detector of, of some kind to detect when you get these glitches, like a missing texture or something like that. So, uh, and, and this is also something that is taking a considerable amount of time when we test the games, because uh, the games are huge and mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of man hours to sit and look through this uh, kind of um, walkthroughs that we create over the games. All mm -hmm. So um, to be a little bit more concrete, it sounds like maybe an application of the work that we've talked about previously where, you know, maybe you're, you've got this curiosity driven agent, but now you, you know, the agent ends up in a position and a, a you know, particular orientation and you are able to capture uh, an image from what it sees and then feed that into a, a CNN that's maybe, is it a classifier like glitch, no glitch or? Um, well, yeah, depending on the game and depending on how you train it, of course, but it's basically a classical classifier uh, and you also get a confidence score. So you, you kind of know uh, how, how like accurate the, the, the uh, detection is uh, and then you flag this uh, and then you kind of walk around and find these glitches in the, in the game. But then uh, again, I mean, it depends on the game. I mean, the games are different. I mean, if you take some of the more open world games, uh, there is a lot of like assets, um, like um, houses, trees, uh, I mean, all of that, cars. Um, uh, but if you think about the sport games, uh, there is other kinds of um, textures that you really need would like to have there. I mean, if you have logotypes into the games, uh, uh, the clothing uh, and so on, mm -hmm. and then you train the model for that, that kind of game. Mm -hmm. And the you mentioned all these different classes of uh, textures and things that you'd insert into a game. Are you, um, to what degree is your, I'm trying to, think about if your model is looking for those things specifically is it some kind of hierarchical model uh or is it just kind of looking at broadly at an entire image uh and just based on the training data looking for for these glitches no it's more looking broadly for 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 glitches in general into the scene so mm -hmm. you have a specific camera position uh, and you change this camera position throughout the object and you rotate around the object you walk around uh taking different scenes uh and that is then how you kind of detect this missing textures or the glitches is in in the mm -hmm. pictures and in terms of your your uh training data for that do you have a a historical database of glitches or i imagine there's a, a huge opportunity here to do synthetic data uh, creation creating artificial glitches or 
something yeah. like that. Um, how, where does the training data come from? I, I guess that's the, one of the upside of working at EA and work within the company, because we have tons of data. Uh, mm -hmm. We have tons of data from the game teams. We have uh, tons of data from game tests. Uh, so there is a rich set of data that we can train for. But of course, we need to label them and so forth. So in that case, we also annotate and synthetically generate glitches of various kinds. So we can train a better model simply that perform better. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a mix there, actually. Okay. So we start with like what kind of glitches are typically encountered into the games. Uh, and then we, we augment them and sort of build up our data sets because in the end we, we when you train this model if they should be reliable uh you need quite a lot of data anyhow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um where do you see ai going in games oh i think ai will going into the games in a multitude of ways uh like we talked quite a lot on about here today uh, in how we create the games, how we create the assets, how we uh, create the worlds, uh, how we create the behaviors, how we create, if you look into games, um, th there is so many things, uh, animations, uh, speech, etc., uh, that, that you can create with uh, AI. Uh, but then eventually we will uh, more and more look into how AI could will be used in the games um, uh, and how it also could drive the game experience uh, in different ways. Uh, you can imagine, for example, you introduce some uh, AI physics. So you, you can create a bit more believable worlds by that there are parts of this that is driven by an AI um, model instead. Um, and uh, there, there is other things like that you can do into the games. You can, like we talked a bit earlier about, you can test assets as they are used in the games. So if you have user generated content of some kind, you can, that's of course not possible to test beforehand, but then you can check whether this asset or this kind of thing that someone has created works in the game. And you can help the user then to create a piece of content that actually do work in the game. Mm -hmm. I think that is also a very interesting kind of future challenge to look into. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Conrad, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it was great hearing a little bit about what you're working on there at uh, EA and KTH. Um, and uh, looking forward to kind of learning more as you continue to push forward in this area. Thanks for having me, Sam.